Um, this is the Ask Me Anything portion of the AAL track, which is really your opportunity as an audience, both in person and online, to ask questions directly to um, the folks in charge of engaging um, with the community via the AAL team. Um, joining us for this session are going to be Art Treviton, uh, Brantz, Brantz, wow. This is funny, by the way, I can say this because I've known Brantz for three years now. I've always said his last name one way, and it turns out I've been saying it wrong. He let me say it for three years. We're part of the team Incorrectly. that has last names that are difficult to pronounce. So I know. all you say is Art or Brantz. It works. <laughs> We're also all friends, so it's okay that I've been calling him Hudzites, but he's huge at, so that's great. Um, <laughs> Brian Hall Halloran, Chad Nash, and Lieutenant uh, Chris Orlowski also coming back up to the stage. So team, welcome up. Um, the way this typically works is we open it up to the audience to ask questions. So I think a great place to start would be for you each to just say a word or two about yourselves. I know that you already got to say a couple words earlier, but uh, just reintroducing what your group does, how you work with people, and just that general information would be a great place to start so we can start asking questions. Awesome. Good? Thank you. All right. Am I coming through all right? Got me loud and clear? Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Um, and we've got a short slide deck as well um, to introduce everybody. But uh, my name is Brant Sujits. Uh, I work with Army Applications Lab. And uh, part of what I do is helping to build out the network of innovators across the country so that as the Army has problems, uh, we can look to see if there are solutions in the commercial marketplace. Uh, so we'll do quick introdu introductions. Yeah, I'll hand over to I'm uh, Art Trevithan, um, also part of the, the corporate ventures team at Army Applications Lab. Little background, um, I've got about 30 years as an entrepreneur, um, did not serve, but bring that um, entrepreneurial small company aspect into, um, if we're gonna serve that the Army with non-traditionals, we better have some non-traditionals who are involved in the process. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Chad Nash. Uh, I represent PMPNT, uh, where we fall under PNT modernization um, at the product level. And our goal is really to leverage the navigate the valley of death from six from from applied research into the products in terms of capability development, um, leverage that valley of death and uh, implement products implement the capability into products. And real quick on that, before I started working for the Army, it actually took me about six months to find out what PNT means. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Acronym. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so position, navigation, and timing. Uh, where you are relative to uh, from 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 space. Cool. Awesome. And we've got uh, Chris Orlowski on the line as well. So Chris, if you can do a quick introduction for us. Hey, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, instead of calling from a tent at Camp Grayling, I'm now calling from my car as I'm trying to get home today. So I appreciate being here and the time. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm the uh, product manager for robotic combat vehicle. Uh, so what we're focused on right now is delivering the programs for both hardware and software uh, that will eventually deliver those capabilities to Army soldiers and formations. So glad to be here. Excellent. All right. Well, I'll kick it off with the first question. If anyone has questions, please raise your hand so I can hand you the microphone. Um, we want to make sure that the folks online can also hear the questions. So please refrain from just shouting them out, unfortunately. Um, so first question for all of you, just very broadly, um, I, I know that you're all working on different capability areas, different priorities. Um, is there a specific uh, contract opportunity coming up that you specifically are working towards um, in the next couple of months? What should these folks here be aware of if they have certain technologies that you're looking for? Uh, that's a great question. We just closed an opportunity last week. Yep. Um, it typically takes us, um, I would expect in the next couple months for us to be announcing new opportunities. Um, but as AL has grown over the last two years, we've definitely scaled up the number of opportunities where we're announcing. Um, I think that when I first joined uh, AL about a year and a half ago, we, we had around six or eight projects that we launched, uh, contracting opportunities that we launched. Um, and uh, within the last year, six months or so, uh, we've probably almost doubled that. Um, so definitely ramping up how, how many opportunities there are throughout the year. Yeah, and looking at uh, well more than 20 in 2022. So, I mean, we're, we're probably looking at two a month. Here's the thing. It, because we don't do a tremendous number of projects, we're kind of uh, putting our bet on the projects that we do. Right, so we're, we're doing fewer projects and putting more resources towards them. Um, those are resources from uh, 
Brants and the rest of the CV team going out and doing research into an industry so that we get the best solvers. It's from our tech team. Casey just left here. She's got a whole series of PhDs. They're doing research into the technology so that we're getting best of breed. And we've got an absolute crackerjack project management team who works with the companies all the way through. So instead of just launching the, the funding opportunity and waiting for something to come back, we're actually active in it all the way through. We have active communications. Um, Chris is actually on one of those projects right now and working with our project manager probably on a daily basis. Um, you know, we, we often joke that we move in with you when it starts happening. We happen to be in just a little bit of a lull right now. As Brand said, we just had one close. Two weeks previous to that, we had three of them up there. We've had closes right along the way. There's a whole nother batch that are getting ready to come out. Um, and I would expect to see them uh, within the next couple of weeks. Great. And, and at the PM level for PMPNT, we leverage a combination of um, Army Application Lab contracts, um, as well as through the Applied Cyber Program. Um, also within the PM, we have uh, access through our Open Innovation Lab website. Um, so we can point you in that direction as well uh, as upcoming events and opportunities are available. Great. Here, let me give you the microphone. You are the PM. Mm -hmm. Is there a, or a consolidated place or where, where could one go to find, you know, all the projects uh, that you, uh, let's, say, let's say past, present, and future? Uh, I say that from a, uh, the perspective of trying to figure out opportunities to partner with the folks that may have already won yep. uh, the contracts and so forth and so on. So kind of a, a, a couple ways, and I'm going to speak towards Army Applications Lab. You can speak towards PM because we're two separate organizations. Right. Um, Army Applications Lab, first of all, yes, we meet the legal requirement. We do post things on SAM, right? Besides so Sam. besides <laughs> Sam, right? Because anybody who's been in there wants to get out of there as quickly as possible. Um, we actually publish about the things that we do on LinkedIn very extensively, on uh, Twitter extensively, and make sure that we are speaking to our marketplace, right? Our marketplace is not the primes. It's not the people who know how to use Sam. It's the people who know how to use Twitter. It's the people who know how to use those. As a consolidated place, honestly, if you go into our newsfeed on LinkedIn, you can read back and see who won every project. You can see what our projects are. And to give you even a little more insight, um, going into the next year, 2022, as Army Applications Lab, we've laid out a couple of uh, priorities, right? Um, these, of course, align with all modernization priorities that the Army has. Um, first up is going to be AI and robotics. You know, how does it apply to drones? How do we use that? Another one is going to be human performance, um, soldier readiness. How do we get down that route? And then, of course, the really highly defined um, electrification, right? Electrification is a huge issue. It, it deals with green elements. It deals with it's not just batteries, but how do you use them? What is the infrastructure required? How do we get through to the end of an electrification process? What do we need to change to get there? And that's that's kind of our 22 priorities. I'm sure some of those will carry on well beyond 22. Um, we also, of course, have that fourth lane, which is um, if we find something amazing, we can chase something amazing. Shameless plug as well, on the AL.Army website, there's a little form at the bottom where you can enter uh, your email, short description of what you do, kind of what industries you align with, uh, so that when we have opportunities in relevant uh, industries or technology areas, we'll send you a note via the email and to let you know about new opportunities. Shameless plug there. <laughs> And then another shameless plug on, on the PNT side, if it's specific to navigation, so position, navigation, and timing, um, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to our Open Innovation Lab website. Uh, that's aptoil.army.mil. Um, we can provide that address for you as well, and you can uh, see what contracts uh, we're currently going, you know, what, what opportunities are currently available and past contracts. 
and I don't want to forget about Chris. Chris. So we got, um, as Art mentioned, we're working with the AL on the sustainment cyber. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll be talking about AI and robotics as well, since uh, we got to figure out how we're going to do uh, lots of robots for the Army and big robots with guns. Uh, applied cyber office as well, we're looking, and then uh, if things go well, could see some, maybe not contracting opportunities, but some uh, opportunities to help inform what the RCV programs will look like in the form of RFIs, at least in the next year. Um, after that, we'll, we'll we'll see about when actual solicitations for programs come out to be Chris, determined. Where's, Chris, where's the best place to see those RFIs as they come out? Uh, we will likely post them to betasam.gov, but... Uh, Maybe I can get our PAO to start, you know, picking up some of the best practices, best practices from AAL as well. And we can definitely compliment that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Capital Fact is also happy to help signal boost those things. We can we can tweet out those links so people can find where to uh, access them. If you have our Twitter account, we will certainly help you to find those resources. Uh, next question is from the Hop In Chat. Uh, how far ahead do you lock in your budgets, or when specifically should small businesses start the business development process? So I'm going to say start your business development process now, not in terms of a specific opportunity, but in terms of learning about us and how we work, right? Um, for a small company coming and working with the Army, there's a bit of a, there's that culture shift, right? Because we are big Army ultimately, and learning how to work with the Army, reading up on it, finding the resources who can help you get ready so that when a solicitation goes out, that's something that's in your lane or your lane adjacent, you're ready to move. Also, don't buy the hype. We don't always know what we need. We know what we want. We don't know what we need, right? Um, the Army's been around for a very long time and has certain ways that they say, we do it this way. Does that mean it's the right way? No, it means the way that's written into the book, right? So if you have a better way and we're saying, hey, we want, we want something that uh, improves the process of, of firing a howitzer, it might actually be an inventory management system instead of a robotic arm. It might actually be something else in the process that we've been doing it on paper. We've been doing it with the uh, abacus forever, and that's not the most efficient way to do it. So being solution adjacent and improving process improves what we do. I, Chad, I'd love to know your perspective from the PM side. Um, uh, how how early should should small businesses start the biz dev process? So you see, I was smiling and laughing because yeah. because <laughs> your team would do all the work really for that. So for for us, um, I would say align your planning to the uh, your calendar year planning to the government fiscal year. Yeah. So if you're going in in, in an August or September timeframe at the end of the government fiscal year, that's not a good time. Um, start in October, you know, and start planning uh, from October and beyond. Uh, that way the the budget team has a timeline in which we can build you in and um you know definitely not towards the end of the year though and end of the fiscal year so aligning it to the fiscal year would be would be good that's awesome does, does that make sense yeah okay. absolutely chris do you have a how's your perspective on that um any i, I thought that was a gem right there so any other <laughs> gems that you'd like to add chris on on how companies should approach bd or biz dev uh from the pm side no, I don't think I can top that one. Just talk, you know, <laughs> talk to us. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll, especially if we don't have solicitations on the street, we can definitely sell these things straight, right? What we think, and we'll we'll answer the questions you have the best we can about um, future opportunities and what we think where programs are going. Um, and just have a dialogue. Uh, awesome. But uh, the rule of thumb I always said is if you're going to talk technical as a business development person, bring the technical person with you because it's great advice. It's, it's yeah. Great. It's always a good, always good to have that person with you to ask those technical questions because we like to dive deep when we can. Nice, Chad and Chris. Do you guys have flexibility within the, the fiscal year to work on opportunities that come out of left field, or you know, if there's something that is not on your guys' radar but it's a really good idea, uh, should companies plan on putting that like for the next fiscal year? 
how much flexibility you guys have? Good question. So um, for on the gov- you know, on the PM side, right, if there's another contract that's available, if you have other customers uh, that you're working with, uh, sometimes we can leverage existing contracts, right? So, so starting a new contract may may take a little bit longer than than near you know the first one or two months. But if there's a, an existing contract that you could offer uh, offer us uh, when we see that capability and we like it. Uh, there may be an opportunity of us using other labs or other contracts that are available. So, and and, and AAL is actually one of the one of our go to. Uh, you know, go to uh, partners. So there's something through AAL. If you have something with AAL, um, that's probably going to be a first stop for us because we are partners and uh, we look to see what opportunities are available first there. Awesome. Appreciate that. Um, We've got another question uh, from Hoppin. And honestly, I'm so excited to hear you guys' perspective on this one because even being uh, inside the Army, I still have trouble with this. But who are the decision makers within the Army? uh, And like, who needs to sign off before you guys can buy something. So let me jump in just a second in that I've actually been asked this question a whole bunch today <laughs> and yesterday walking around. I kind of came up with the thing is we we pull together the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, right? That's the guy who wants it, the guy who has the contracting ability and the guy who has the money. This is the guy with the contracting ability or the guy who wants it, right? This this is the butcher, right? right. So, so how do you how do you make that decision? Okay, so we have a host of uh, levels of approval we, we will need to go through as well. Probably at the PM or the acquisition side, we're at that lower, the lower level. Um, we, through our AFC, through Army's Future Command, um, we would bring the project across their plate, you know, for consideration. Uh, and if we have the funding, if, if it's, there, there's a line between research and development, right, and also production. So understanding the maturity of the technology, the maturity of the capability uh, is one of our will be one of our first questions. How mature is it? Is it something that we can use uh, our, our research and development dollars for or is it something that we can use as production? So determining uh, that is one key piece of it. Uh, the other approval is obviously our at the uh, pro, pro, program executive office. So getting the approval at that level um, as well. So once once we get the OK, usually things will move through. Uh, over the next few weeks, but uh, getting that uh, concurrence really is probably one of the key key pieces of that. So it sounds like reiterating here in in, uh, in, in dummy English here, um, it sounds like there's like the PM shop um, understanding if there's funding and, and where the TRL levels are, um, and then that. the PEO side as well. Roger that, and, and I'd be remiss if I don't mention the time, the schedule. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, ha- aligning it with the budget process and and, and quarter by quarter. Uh, will allow us to make sure that we have the proper planning and time for paperwork and those types of things. So you mentioned a couple of things uh, real quickly that are interesting rabbit holes to, to go down. Uh, you've mentioned applied cyber a couple of times, and you mentioned the distinction between R&D and production funds. So can you help uh, our audience understand a little bit about the, the TRL or the stages of technologies that you work in? and you work primarily on, on production, you work primarily on R&D, or is it like an equal mix across all of those? Great, great question. So uh, typically on the, uh, uh, in, within the PM, the PM can only accept TR, technology readiness level six and above. Thank you, I, uh, I, owe, what, I owe the acronym JAR some money. <laughs> yeah. So what, what that means is you're in the prototyping stage. Uh, breadboard, and a breadboard capability is typically uh, TRL uh, five, Right. So if you bring us something and, and, and it's not ruggedized, that's OK. Um, but we have the we would have to partner with an, with a lab based organization that can that can handle the, that that is responsible for the research and development piece of it. So on the PM side, we typically have to take something at a higher maturity level. Um, and then we all have to plan. How does it how does it make its way into the product? So there's uh, things what we call pre planned product improvement. Uh, that's a specific time in which we uh, will implement a capability into an existing cap- into an existing product. Uh, so once we understand that, there's a, there's that, that's where we have to understand from an engineering perspective the maturity, uh, so that we can look at the uh, manufacturing readiness level. MRL is another thing because uh, we're dealing in larger quantities. So for small businesses, uh, that may mean par- partner with a larger business, um, but again, us understanding the capability. And that's kind of the path along. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. I appreciate okay. that. What's the timeline of that? Like from uh, on, on the integration piece, especially, you know, if you're working with a company that's TRL six and 
you mature it to a tier all nine. I, I know that's going to take a while. Um, when does the integration start um, into the, the larger product or platform? Um, so, so on the product level, right, we have uh, the pre-planned product improvement. So it all depends on what the capability is. Uh, and then assuming that the maturity level is at a high enough level, um, as is emerging capabilities, right, uh, that, that path, really our acquisition path right now is about 18 months from the time we see something uh, to the time we can implement it from a software perspective. Hardware perspective, that number doubles. So there, it all depends on what, what it is um, and then how we can test, how, how it can be tested. That's awesome. Chris, are you seeing similar uh, similar timelines on the, the hardware side? I, I can imagine working in the RCV world, uh, there's probably a, a few more complexities on the hardware stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't think we're as mature as Chad's programs are in terms of how we're integrating software and hardware. We're still working through a lot of prototyping phases and Chad mentioned there's different there's different even colors of the research and development dollars and what you can spend it on so um, there's little different shades but yeah I mean we sometimes have that challenge of looking at a platform it's like well you should be able to turn these things fast and between long lead items and COVID supply chain disruptions it's you know we're looking at least a year before we can get new hardware uh, sometimes if it's based pretty much based off something we already have uh, so that's that's another and then let alone the design time to cut something else in. So yeah, I would say those those are pretty good rules of thumb for now. We'd all obviously like to go faster, but there's a lot of a lot of factors that go into going faster. Awesome, I appreciate that. So I, hopefully this doesn't put you guys on the spot, but I always love this question. Uh, so whoever asked this, thank you. Uh, what are Chad and Chris? What are success metrics for you guys? Like what does what does um, <coughs> Uh, a great success look like uh, when you guys are working on a project? So I'll say from a technology perspective, the first one is if we have an actual injection into the product, right? That, that's, that's key metric number mm -hmm. one. If we have the ability, the time and the schedule uh, to implement into the product, that's a success. Um, the other piece of it is uh, testing. How do we test it? Um, and, and if we're able to get that measurable data uh, that we're going to, that will be required um, and last but not least, I'm, you know, probably the most important is soldier feedback, customer feedback. Uh, as, as we get a lot of the human, um, hu hu human uh, factors and, and human understanding, uh, how e the ease to incorporate it and the soldier understanding it, um, that for us is key success. Um, if, we can, if we can have opportunities in the field, whether it's through an operational test or operational assessment, um, if it's something at the prototype level, so something that's going to be in a lab-based environment, uh, having the soldiers come in and give us direct feedback uh, would probably be one of the key pieces for us. How do you get that feedback back to the vendor, right? The, so, so the guy who's making the thing, right, that we're going to add in or, or supplement what we're doing, what does that feedback channel look like? Great, great question. So sometimes, uh, and then I'll turn over to Chris for his perspective as well. Uh, some, sometimes that feedback is a closed loop. You, you, the, uh, the vendor will give the government a lot of information and you never hear anything back. Um, but through opportunities, um, through the lab-based environment like the Open Innovation Lab, through AAL, um, our, our goal really is to make sure that it's, it's a certain, you get feedback back from the government as well. So, so as we get that data, we like to, you know, summarize it. We like to provide it um, back to the vendor to make the next implement uh, in increment better. Um, so, so we're getting better at that. It has not always been like that. Uh, a lot of times it's been closed loop, but do, you'll see through system demonstrations or system capabilities like, like pin tax, PNT assessment exercise, um, we're, we're look or through the um, convergence events, co mm -hmm. convergence. Uh, those are other opportunities. Now we're building that baseline for us to allow us to give feedback back to the vendors. I, uh, I talked with a company earlier today who said they got some absolutely brutal feedback from a government uh, uh, client uh, recently. They said it was, I was heartbroken, but at the same time, it was the best thing that happened because like now I know what's broken and what I need to improve. So uh, right. I know that, that uh, the, the feedback loop goes a really long ways. Chris, what are your thoughts on that? In terms of metrics and being graded? Um, well, the tr more traditional ones, we get graded on cost. Are we in call within cost? Are we meeting schedule? And are the systems performing the way they're supposed to be? Uh, 
but that's more of a program grade, not the program manager itself so much. Um, we get beat up all the time in execution of money. Um, are we obligating our dollars? Are we putting on a contract according to our plans? And is are those and you know, is the contractors mainly are they spending the money like we expect? Congress takes a look at that too. So if we're not beating those numbers, Congress can it's like, well, we're going to take money from you this year because you're not spending what we gave you. Uh, so that's an important thing for both the and both the government and the contractors side to remember that you've all got a part to play in that. Uh, but to, just to follow the soldier feedback, I think that with AFC and this understanding that we're often buying things that soldiers, it's not the exact thing the soldiers need. Uh, the number of soldier touch points and number of soldier interactions is also something that we're being, I don't say maybe necessarily graded on, but a thing that people are definitely looking at is like, are you doing, are you getting these systems, whether they're hardware or software, both in the hands of soldiers and gaining their feedback and incorporating that in the program? So it's definitely an emerging, I don't know if we've got a metric for it yet. Like you must do so many, thou shalt do so many, but it's definitely something uh, senior leaders in the army are taking a look at. So outside of that, so there, there are some, you know, of course, official metrics, official things you look at. How do you gauge success, Chris? What, 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 to you is success? <laughs> uh, so I'd say a couple things. One is uh, making sure that the the RCV experiment next summer uh, goes as best as it can and we can get as much soldier feedback and learning from that experiment. Uh, we take those lessons learned and incorporate it into the next and then just delivering the best programs we can in the near future. So uh, making sure that we're working with our partners in AFC and the develop, development command and contractors to really define what those programs should be and deliver them near term. And then we won't know. There's a bit of a lag in that system, right? By the time you build and integrate and test to see if you really did the right thing. But in the near term, that's our that's our goals in the organization. So there's several channels into uh, for, for small businesses to connect into to PM shops. And obviously, AAL is one channel, but we're not the only channel. What are the best ways for small businesses to get in, into contact with folks like yourself? Uh, and I'm thinking in particular, some of the, the testing and evaluation opportunities where companies can demo and showcase their products. Um, how would you recommend uh, small business small businesses get in contact with you guys? Um, for for PMPNT, our front door is our uh, well, is our oil website, our Open Innovation Lab website. Um, so again, that URL can be provided, and and through there you would actually fill out a uh, vendor a vendor template, basically, or or a, a vendor profile. Uh, when you fill out that vendor profile, that's uh, behind the scenes. It's uh, passed to our our Open Innovation Lab team, um, and they're able to make sure that your profile is complete. Uh, they're able to get you a one-on-one -on -one interview with the government team uh, for PMPNT um, and also other stakeholders as well will join that call for a technical interchange meeting um, to further understand your capability and potentially demonstrate it at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground. That's awesome. Um, so uh, AEL, we've been leveraging a lot of SBIR uh, grants so far. Um, and I'm curious, uh, it sounds like somebody online is curious that they've done an SBIR so far. Uh, what can they be doing right now to prepare themselves to be working uh, at the PM level? Is it just introducing themselves and, and saying hello or any pro tips that you guys would recommend? Um, I would say the first thing is, you know, work, working through that phase one, phase two, SIBR, right? Um, during that time, uh, there, there usually is a stakeholder, a government, st a PM stakeholder involved in that process as it matures. Uh, being able to make sure you have that network or that interface with that PM is critical. Um, so, so having those the PM contacts, those acquisition contacts, um, would be one one probably good method um, as you're as you're maturing your capability through the cyber work and ultimately looking for a successful uh, implementation into a product. And then if there's something that you want to get directly to the PM. Again, that face-to-face -face is important, providing that technical capability. So uh, for, for PMPNT, it would be the website, but I'm sure there's other other venues as, as well out there. Chris, how about your perspective? Yeah, it's a tough, I mean, I think we were, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have that cool website. I mean, it sounds like we need to build it. Um, <laughs> especially when we start thinking the software for RCVs and all the things that are needed to make these things go. Uh, 
Yeah, I think primarily it's through there's a, you know public facing PEO ground combat systems. That's our as Chad mentioned earlier. That's my program executive office I work for. We tend to primarily interact through requests for information and other things like that out to industry, and then follow on engagements from that it's primarily. But I, obviously, with lessons learned, we probably need to improve some of our processes, especially as we need to start moving faster uh, on certain things. Awesome, I appreciate that. Um, what are what are some of the pain points that you guys are feeling right now? Um, like, are are there any uh, are there any processes that you think could work better as far as how you engage with small businesses? I'm sure Chris has a list of this <laughs> too. Um, so 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 for us, uh, the challenge really is um, legacy uh, cap legacy sensors. How do you integrate with legacy platforms or legacy sensors uh, and bring a, a, an emerging capability, something that's disruptive? How do we how do we get into the field? How do we get it into it? We're not, you know, the this, the days of just swapping things out, uh, you know, swapping boxes out uh, due to budget constraints, timing constraints, uh, you name it. Uh, that's a challenge now. So we're looking to leverage what's already existing, uh, whether on a soldier's person or integrated into a vehicle. Um, how do you leverage existing uh, existing sensors? Um, really is probably one of the big gaps, you know, to to your point that we're that we're trying to address. Um, and then there's a big push for open architecture. So following modular open suite, uh, you know, modular open system architecture, uh, leveraging industry standards um, is, is where we're, we're, all, we're all heading um, in order to, to pace the threat. So uh, being able to show a pathway or, or a path to um, an open system and open standard uh, really will be one of, is one of the um, gaps that we're trying to fill now. Okay. Chris? So I, I would take that a little, I agree with Chad, but uh, I think it's a process thing too. Um, so even if you've got a very successful SIBR or a small business or they did, maybe they didn't do it through a SIBR means or they did it through an OTA or what have you, is being able to quickly get them working on your program is non-trivial sometimes, right? If there's not an open contracting mechanism, uh, we can't always just say, yes, we want that. We've got to go compete it. And then that just adds lag and time into the system and obviously puts a burden on that business because now they're, well, those those team members now need to go do something else, right? They can't just be overhead and not be producing for the company. So uh, we're, we've talked to some other folks, uh, some other organizations, both in and out of the government in some ways. And so we're thinking through how um, that process works, especially talking software um, for our CVs in the future. So. Um, if there's folks with ideas or feedback on how you know, we can improve that, I'd definitely be open to hearing it because um, especially when it gets to autonomy and artificial intelligence, we can't wait 12 months to award something for something that we know is, you know, somebody's already moved past it by the time we get that awarded. So we got to figure out how to move faster on that standpoint. Be careful what you ask for, Chris. I think asking a room like this uh, for feedback, you, you just might get it. <laughs> um, similar question, but uh, I, I, as a as a PM, what keeps you up at night? Um, you know, whether it's about the the operations and how you operate, uh, about um, the the programs that you run, are there things that um, that that long term uh, you, you want to see uh, co better collaboration from industry um, with? Well, I would say the threat keeps keep me up keeps me up at night. Um, as the emerging threats always changing, uh, how do you rapidly pace the threat? How do you uh, provide a way to increment, you know, pro provide a way to scale a capability and be able to, imp you, know, you know, provide as a um, defense against a certain threat, right? So, so again, things like open architecture uh, is, a, is a means of us getting to, to be able to pace the threat. Um, the other one uh, I think that keeps, keeps me up is if a vendor brings a great disruptive capability and we have no contract to get to them. Um, so that also costs time developing a contract. How do we get to uh, the non-traditionals um, without having a contract in place already? Um, so, so the acquisition side and understand the contracting, um, innovative contracting, we just had the, the, the workshop on that one prior to this. So I think some of those approaches uh, will help um, mitigate or, or minimize the timeline uh, to take advantage of some of the non-traditional capabilities. Chris, anything you'd like to add there? Uh, 
I'd say that one one challenge, big challenge, and this is this will be no surprise anybody who's filming with robots is uh, developing, testing, uh, certifying, if that's the best word, at least that's the first word that comes to mind, uh, autonomy for RCVs. Because really, to what that base mobility of the platform is really what's going to push the value proposition, or it was one of those things, and how we develop it, how we test it, how we certify it, make sure it's safe for soldiers is uh, is a big challenge we have in the program, and we're constantly thinking about it. And yes, it does keep me up at night sometimes. I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate the honesty there from you guys. It's good feedback. And uh, again, talking to a room of, of innovators, I, I think they might come up with some solutions. Um, you know, I'm curious to know uh, what collaboration across DOD organizations look looks like from uh, from the PM level. Um, is it you mostly work with Army? Army soldiers, or do you work with uh, other divisions, other branches? Oh, it's it's encouraged actually to work across DOD. So whether it's Air Force, Army, Navy, um, you know, in terms of open architecture, open architecture uh, means a lot. So so us being able to converge across services, um, you know, Air Force using the same architecture uh, baseline, or Navy using the same architecture baseline. Uh, so so we have a lot of um, involvement with consortiums. So the ability to be able to have that joint partnership uh, between industry, academia, um, and other DOD organizations um, has been a big push as, as we move towards open architecture. Um, so so that, that's just one example, but I, I, it is highly encouraged, um, something that we work, on, you know, work, work together uh, moving towards. Awesome. I have a question, Brett. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a point that I wanted to touch on just because we've had a bunch of really great sessions with all the divisions. So you mentioned working cross collaborative, mm -hmm. co collaboratively, right? Um, what can things, uh, what can the acquisitions teams within the Air Force and the Navy and DIU and all these other groups do to better collaborate with you? Like, is, is there a contracting way that they can make that easier to, to expedite that process? Or what, what pieces of advice would you give if the word of the day is cross collaboration. That's a hard question. That's a I know it one. is. Everyone's um, working on it too. <laughs> yeah. So we're still trying to figure that out as well. Um, you know, in terms of having a venue, you know, to be able to collaborate cross, cross organization. Um, I think one, one of the biggest things is communication, uh, being able to have platforms like this, being able to get your, get your capability out and understand who's doing what, because a lot of times we don't communicate cro across, um, so, so some of the capabilities or, or requirements, if you will, um, that other organizations may have, uh, knowing that we're trying to tackle the same problem um, and, and someone we can incorporate other lessons learned from other groups as they go across, you know, as they develop their solutions. Um, so I, I'd say the biggest way um, would be communication, open communication. And the venue, I, I think digital means like this is, is probably the best one the moment. Chris, I'll turn. What, what do you think? I, I think communication is key and it's just it's, it's hard because we get so busy and we're, it's not purposeful negligence or anything like that. But you just go to get so focused on your program and trying to deliver capability for us to soldiers, for everybody else could be guardians, airmen, Marines, sailors, whoever. And if you don't stop or have somebody who knows the somebody, I think it's not just it's also networking. As well. You know, having those folks that will help uh, connect people. So, um, a, a good, good, group, good example is the OSD team that's governing the new software acquisition pathway. They've been fantastic helping my program reach out to stake or partners, I should say, in the Air Force, the Space Force, and the Navy to get examples on how they're leveraging these new software programs, and it's been very helpful for us. Uh, on the topic topic of communication, I'm curious to know from your perspective. Um, from outside the army, I think I always would look in and think, okay, everything that happens there is like super secret and secure. And like, there's a reason they don't talk to industry. Um, is classified information and secure stuff, is that actually a barrier to communication um, in, in interaction with industry? Uh, or is that maybe just a, a, a misconception uh, from, from small businesses? I think classification uh, and security, I'll say, is, is always a big factor. Um, so, so, if we have a means to get to you through a contract, right, we can put that specific, uh, the specific capabilities or the specific technology that we're looking at. Um, that'd be kind of part of the, part of the uh, contract criteria. 
Um, there are limitations to things that we can say in public forums. Uh, we can give kind of general general capabilities um, as as we discuss and have we as we build partnerships, right? And, and I think the the specific criteria will come out um, whether it's classified, mean you know through the proper communication channels. Um, so sometimes that is a limiting factor of what we can put out in RFIs. Um, but the assumption is, uh, or the goal is, as as we go down the contract path. Uh, we, we can have that discussion at a, at a higher classified level. Uh, number one is to see if the vendor meets those meet that meets that criteria um, or the ability to meet that criteria. Chris. Yeah, I'd, if if there I mean, it can be an administrative barrier, as Chad was referring to. There's a thing called the DD 254. Uh, Right, or might get 250. I I'm, I'm, might be confusing it, but it gives access to contractors to classified information. I might have messed the number up, but it's one of the two. Um, if so if they don't have that, then we can't necessarily have a conversation. Uh, but even if they have that from other programs, we can, but we just have to make sure we get in the right form and do all the checks on clearances and things. So it should not be um, as long as there's a need to have the discussion, right? As long as the appropriate uh, parties have a, a need to know, we it should not be a barrier if we can get everything done right. Awesome. And all, all in all, I mean, the thing that keeps on coming up here is collaboration, whether it be collaboration between you guys in Army Applications Lab, between the, the vendors and us or you, or between branches. Um, I think the ultimate message for everyone to take from this is that cross communicate open honest and and transparent communications between all of us actually help us get the job done and that job being to solve a soldier problem and bring in the rest of the solver community the non-traditional solver community to the party and be able to participate with us in helping us bring the best solutions to to the soldier I agree I agree absolutely so I think we've got about a minute left. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I know we've taken a lot of questions from Hop in here. Going once, going twice. No more questions. I guess that's it. Oh, wait, we got one we more. Got Just one. kidding. Let me give you the mic. <laughs> from the beanbags. <laughs> Make it fast and make it good. We've got the last one. Sure, so uh, AAL's kind of new to the scene. Uh, still has a fresh new car smell. Um, I imagine you guys are sort of building the plane while you're learning how to fly it. Um, what have been some of the most interesting sort of learnings and shifts in how you've approached your opportunities that you award and execute? So uh, from my perspective, while I'm, I'm new to working for the Army, but have as a vendor before participated, um, I think what's new, quite frankly, is that spirit of openness and the desire to work with as opposed to work against a vendor. There, there's not, um, years ago, there was a kind of a clash in that you're just trying to get money out of the government, right? And so the vendor wasn't always, especially a small one, wasn't looked at in a positive light. Um, these days, I, I certainly see a tremendous desire from, uh, from the Army and from the DOD as a whole to say, this is where we're going to get the best solutions. We need to work with them. So much more that spirit of openness to new solutions. Excellent. And our little ticking time bomb down here just went <laughs> off. So thank you for filling. <laughs> All right, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.